Hello and welcome to another video. In this video I'm going to be talking about the uncanny. You probably heard of the uncanny valley, which is a term created in 1970 by robotics professor Masahiro Mori. And this term describes the human reaction when seeing things that are human-like but not quite human. Examples like prosthetic limbs, humanoid robots, and even zombies and corpses are used in the graph describing this phenomenon. As things get more and more human-like, we start to feel more familiar with the object until it reaches a certain point. Right before it becomes undistinguishable from human beings, our positive emotions to the object dips into a valley of uncomfortable feelings. And this is what the uncanny valley is. However, today I want to go even further back to the beginning of the 20th century when the term uncanny was first introduced. The term was created first by psychiatrist Ernst Jentsch in 1906 and then later expanded on by Sigmund Freud in 1919. In German, the uncanny is called das Unheimliche, which translates roughly to unhomely or something that is strangely familiar. So what I'm gonna be doing in this video is give you a bit of backstory um, to the history of the uncanny and also tell you a bit more what this feeling is all about. Then I want to mention specific artworks and media spanning all the way from the beginning of the 1900s up to now that invoke these uncomfortable, uncanny feelings. Part 1. The Uncanny with the word unheimlich, the German language seems to have produced a rather fortunate formation. Without a doubt, this word appears to express that someone to whom something uncanny happens is not quite at home or at ease in the situation concerned, that the thing is or at least seems to be foreign to him. In brief, the word suggests that a lack of orientation is bound up with the impression of the uncanniness of a thing or incident. It is thus comprehensible if a correlation, new, foreign, hostile, corresponds to the physical association of old, known, familiar. A story called The Sandman, written in 1816 by E.T.A. Hoffman, is centered around the character of Nathaniel who falls in love with a mechanical doll named Olympia. He is tricked into believing that the doll is a real woman by seeing her through a pair of magical spy glasses sold to him by a mysterious optician called Coppola. Nathaniel becomes deeply obsessed with this doll and the story ends with Nathaniel committing suicide during a fit of madness. The story intrigued both Ernst Jentsch and Sigmund Freud as they both decided to use this story to explain the phenomenon of the uncanny. Jentsch used the story mainly to explain the emotional response one would get seeing something that is almost lifelike, like the effect of the uncanny valley I mentioned earlier. He writes, Among all the physical uncertainties that can become a cause for the uncanny feeling to arise, there is one in particular that is able to develop a fairly regular, powerful and very general effect, namely doubt as to whether an apparently living being really is animate and, conversely, doubt as to whether a lifeless object may not in fact be animated. And more precisely, when this doubt only makes itself felt obscurely in one's consciousness. The unpleasant impression is well known that readily arises in many people when they visit collection of whack figures, panopticons and panoramas. In semi-darkness it is often especially difficult to distinguish a life-size wax or similar figure from a human person. Jentsch also explains the uncanny as something that deviates from expectations. He uses the rising and setting as the sun as an example, how ever since childhood people have come to accept that the sun will rise and set in our sky during the day. What creates the uncanny feeling is taking a moment to think about the fact that it's not the sun moving across the sky, it is in fact the earth rotating around it that creates the effect. He also mentions things like insanity and hallucinations creating an uncanny feeling, 
as these kinds of episodes will create a rift between reality and what the person is experiencing. So Freud then read the essay that Jentsch wrote about the uncanny and decided to expand on the term. And here is where it gets a little bit muddy and abstract. Freud also used the story of the sad man written by Hoffman to explain his findings. And although he did agree um, with what Jentsch was saying about the mechanical doll Olympia invoking feelings of uncanniness, he claimed that the true uncanniness came from the involvement of the Sandman and the fear of losing one's eyes. The Sandman is a character that appears in several children's stories and also who the story is named after who sprinkles sand in children's eyes to make them go to sleep. In Hoffman's story, he throws sand in their eyes, causing their eyes to jump out of their skull. There's also several mentions about people's eyes all throughout the story, and the main character Nathaniel exclaims, fine eyes, beautiful eyes, right before flinging himself off a tower and killing himself. Freud writes in his essay, I think no doubt that the feeling of something uncanny is directly attached to the figure of the Sandman, that is, to the idea of being robbed of one's eyes. We know from psychoanalytic experience, however, that this fear of damaging or losing one's eyes is a terrible fear of childhood. Many adults still retain their apprehensiveness in this respect, and no bodily injury is so much dreaded by them as an injury to the eye. Freud then also goes on to compare the fear of losing one's eyes to the fear of castration, which is where he kind of loses me. A study of dreams, fantasies and myths has taught us that a morbid anxiety connected with the eyes and with going blind is often enough a substitute for the dread of castration. <sighs> Typical Freud, <laughs> making everything to be about castrations. Anyway, another example of the uncanny that is mentioned in this essay is the double. That it's a double. The double can be anything from a twin or a clone, someone who looks just like you but still isn't you. Telepathy kind of goes hand in hand with this, sharing the same thoughts with another person or even multiplying your mind into someone else. He also talks about multiplying and repetition, seeing a certain number over and over again. At one point, Freud also talks about an experience he had going on vacation. He wandered around the city, um, eventually getting lost and finding himself walking in circles. Over and over he would find himself in, in a place he had already been, recognizing the buildings and surroundings. The feeling this created, recognizing your surroundings while still feeling anxious and lost, as well as the same environment constantly repeating, he claimed was very uncanny. Lastly, I want to mention how dreams relate to the uncanny. Both Jentsch and Freud agree that the uncanny feeling arises when reality tends to disort. Uncertainness is a big factor in the creation of the uncanny, and dreams are often filled with uncertain emotions and a mix of reality and imagination. Dreams are often familiar and sometimes comes with a feeling of dread or helplessness. Part 2. Uncanny Artworks So now I want to bring up some artworks that capture this uncanny essence. Um, I want to warn you that some of the art artworks depicted might be a little bit unsettling. So the first artwork I want to mention is um, an artwork created by artist Hans Bellmer in 1935. Bellmer did many dolls all throughout his artistic career and photographed them in certain poses and settings. This one took inspiration from the wooden dolls often used by artists and had movable joints that could be manipulated into different poses. The doll is human-like and positioned to stand upright, like a human, in a seemingly normal setting, but it's obviously not human. 
The fact that it reminds us of a human being is not the only thing that makes this piece of art uncanny. It also plays with the idea of the double and repetition. The lower part of the body is being repeated on the upper part. Some body parts are even doubling as other body parts. Reading a description of the work, we find out that a pelvis is being used as a stomach and a butt is being used for the chest. The grainy quality of the photo and the lack of color also enhances the uncanny feelings as it makes it harder to make out what's actually in the photo. We're left wondering, what are we really looking at? And then the next one is by Robert Gober and it's called Untitled Leg from 1990. So it's just a leg sticking out of a wall. Yet the simple idea stirs very strong emotions in a lot of people. The leg is very realistic, it, it even uses real human hair as leg hair. And the fact that it is dressed with a nice shoe, sock and pants makes it feel very ordinary. That mixed with the fact that it is in fact a dismembered leg sticking out of a wall creates a very strong uncanny effect. It's something that is so ordinary, yet so unordinary. We're also left wondering what happened with the owner of the leg? Is the leg simply cut off? Or has the owner been engulfed by the gallery walls? This is a great example of something that is very familiar to us, yet unexpected. And in turn, we're left feeling the effects of the uncanny. And then the final artwork that I want to talk about before moving on to more contemporary pieces of media is Stare by Jenny Savile from 2006. This piece is a portrait of a woman. It is drawn with loose strokes and line, and her face is starting to blur or duplicate. When we look closer, we see that her eyes and ears are starting to duplicate around her face almost like she's jaggedly moving in and out of time or coming in and out of reality. Maybe she's in the process of cloning herself. The use of red color makes us think of bodily harm. And maybe she's disassociating from reality after having undergone a physical trauma. This drawing brings up many points that were discussed by both Jens and Freud, like the act of duplicating, the dreamlike qualities in the way the lines seem to blur and move, and then also the act of disassociating from reality. So those were the artworks I wanted to mention to show you how one could implement the ideas of the uncanny into visual mediums. Part 3. Uncanny Media. Now I want to talk about more contemporary pieces of media that I think evoke the feeling of the uncanny. I'll do my best not to share any huge spoilers for any of these films and games I'll be talking about. So the first piece of media I want to mention is Silent Hill 2. The game follows the protagonist James as he's looking for his deceased wife Mary. Even though she has passed away, James received a letter from her asking him to meet her at Silent Hill. Shortly after arriving, he meets a woman named Maria. He looks strangely just like his wife. Her name is slightly different and she dresses completely opposite from Mary, but her face and body are pretty much the exact copy of Mary. Already we can draw a connection to what Freud mentioned in his essay about the uncanny. Seeing someone as familiar as your own wife Yet it is not her, it's a stranger. The story continues as the game begins and you are suddenly forced to fight against disturbing creatures, one of which is eerily similar to the doll created by Hans Belmer I talked about earlier in this video. Not only are these creatures uncanny because of their resemblance to humans, they are also uncanny because they symbolize different aspects of James himself. It is well known that these creatures are meant to represent the feelings that James went through as his wife was dying, and so they might not be his doppelgangers visually, but they are reflections of his mind. 
Hoffman accentuates this relation by transferring mental processes from the one person to the other, what we should call telepathy, so that one possesses knowledge, feeling, and experience in common with the other, identifies himself with another person, so that his self becomes confounded, where the foreign self is substituted for his own. In other words, by doubling, dividing, and interchanging the self. The next piece of media is Coraline. So there is a lot of uncanniness to unpack with this one. Coraline is a stop-motion animated film about a girl who happens upon a parallel universe that seems to be a mirror world of her own home. Everyone she knows in the real world exists in this new world, however they are slightly different. <laughs> the first thing I want to mention is, can you guess it? That it's a double. The fact that the new world she finds is a double of her own world. This new place is just like her home, although slightly different. Her parents are like her own parents, although slightly different. This new world becomes more and more unsettling as the movie is progressing, until her other mother says she gets to stay there if she just gives up her eyes. You know, I always thought that Freud was just a dusty old sexist who could only talk about castration over and over again. But you know, he got this part right. <laughs> Losing your eyes is uncanny as fuck. Um, and the fact that they are being replaced by buttons, something that you often find in stuffed toys and dolls, just makes it even more unsettling. Moving on to my next piece of media, which is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. This is actually one of my favorite films of all time, and I have lost count of how many times I have actually seen this movie. The film is about Joel and how he wants to remove his memories of his ex-girlfriend Clementine. He goes to a clinic to have this procedure done and the majority of the film takes us through his dreams and memories of their past relationship. The film is full of amazing visuals and truly captures the strange emotions often felt during dreams. Dreams are the merging of reality and imagination and are by themselves uncanny. As Joel is going through all of his past memories, he is becoming frightened and helpless in what is familiar to him. No longer are his fond memories filled with pleasant and happy emotions, but instead they turn into something that induces panic and anxiety. Also, this scene is just super creepy. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Barish. I thought you understood what was going on here. I don't know. You're erasing her from me. You're erasing me from her. So, the last piece of media I want to talk about is the movie Us. Us is a film made by Jordan Peele and is about a family who encounters their bloodthirsty doppelgangers. Already, you can see where I'm going with this. That it's a double. But I wanted to mention this film just because of how they use repetition and the idea of the double to their advantage. The movie starts off with the main character, Addie, as a child as she enters a funhouse on the boardwalk. Inside, there are mirrors everywhere and already we feel a sense of unsettlement. First of all, these fun houses are supposed to be enjoyed during the daytime, and the fact that this takes place during nighttime already gives us an uncanny feeling. We all know the fun and joy these types of places can give us, but entering one in darkness just gives the situation a feeling of dread. It then moves on to present day and leading up to the family's encounter with their doppelgangers, Abby starts to spot repetitions. Freud wrote about this exact phenomenon in his essay about the uncanny. For instance, we of course attach no importance to the event when we give up a coat and get a cloakroom ticket with a number, say 62, 
or when we find that our cabin on board ship is numbered 62, but the impression is altered if two such events, each in itself indifferent, happen close together. If we come across the number 62 several times in a single day, or if we begin to notice that everything which has a number, addresses, hotel rooms, compartments in railway trains, always has the same one, or one which at least contains the same figures. Abby's family's friends have twin girls that are playing on the beach. She looks down at her clock and it shows 11-11. Shows we get so many of these little things that shouldn't really mean much on their own, but all of them happening so close to one another creates an uneasy tension and cleverly hints about what is to come. Um, Alright, so that is all I have for today. Um, this is a topic that I find incredibly interesting, and I hope you did too. If you like this video, please do give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more. And I will see you again next time. Bye!